Good morning, everybody. Welcome to The Point. Yes, my sidekick and I are thrilled to welcome each one of you who are tuning in online and those who are joining us in person. And the fact that it is amazing to gather here and there and near and far certainly isn't lost on us, is it? No. Today is the peak of our series, Chasing Carrots. Not because it's all downhill from here, but because it's week three of this awesome five-week series. If you are just joining us, no problem. I'll catch you up. But before I do that, would you text the word hello to 812-359-1799 so we can be sure to say hi? Okay. This month, we are focusing on those carrots we all find ourselves running after in life and how to stop and instead pursue what truly satisfies. We have talked about fame, money, and this morning, well, I won't spoil it for you, but I will tell you it's absolutely worth being here. Speaking of running, we want to personally invite you to participate in the World Vision Global 6K on May 22nd. This is a super fun, family-friendly event with a super impact opportunity. Your simple registration gives clean water to one person for life. 6K is the average distance people in the developing world walk for water every day. When we cross the finish line, we have changed the lives of women and children forever. You can learn more and register to be part of the Point team on our website. And Point kids, make sure to sign up because we have some extra special swag just for you. Yeah, come run with us. Right now, let's sing together. <laughs> yeah. You've been walking the same old road for miles and miles. If you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies. If you're trying to fill the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. If you got pain. Dead of night, we've all found ourselves worn out by the same old fight. And we've all run the things we know that just ain't right. But there's a better light, there's a better Sing the 
rise with us this morning as we continue to worship the Lord Jesus in this place. Amen. I'm so thankful for his love this morning. His love that is amazing and that is great. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over.
summer, who really in this, in this, uh, we so fed up, my life, 10 up, your time, been up, big prayers, sent up, uh, couldn't do without him, out of, uh, glad that I found him, found him, uh, crowd really wildin', wildin', uh, I'm kicking it, shallin', shallin', uh, me on young walls with the boss of the, I should sit you on my knee when I talk to you, you ain't tucking on the hand that I offer you, you ain't wanna see the flip, so you off with you. I guess everybody want a spotlight nah. I'm a rebel so I'm rolling through the stop sign yeah. Plenty folk we ain't spoke in a long time long Now time. they yell up on my phone like a hotline Ooh. I don't need no love, bump that I think you're telling lie, chomp rap Hey, good to see you guys uh, I'm taking a little informal poll this morning If you're online you can uh, type it in the chat How many think that's a gerbil? Give me a right, right hand up in the air How many think it's a hamster? How many know the difference? Nobody? How many just say it's a rodent of some sort? We know that's the case. Good to see you. We're in uh, the third week of a five-week series called Chasing Carrots, and we're talking about that endless pursuit of something that is just out of reach and the endless pursuit of more in all these different areas. And uh, today we're going to talk about the unhealthy pursuit of perfection. And, um, you know, people are hard on themselves because uh, they don't get something exactly right. They want everything to be exactly perfect and absolutely perfect. And uh, I would say I wrestle with perfectionism myself sometimes, and I'll bet some of you do as well. Uh, perfectionists may be quick to extend grace to others, but they're unwilling to extend much grace to themselves. And so they live under this load of unrealistic expectations, which can lead to deep senses of shame and guilt and unworthiness. And then to top things off, you hear a verse like Matthew 5, 48, which says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. And that just kind of, boom, dump, dump the big load on you there. I mean, of guilt and pressure and all of that. That's what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. And so this message today is really for anybody that feels the persuasion or the pressure to be perfect. Now, I, I think this uh, really relates a lot to moms. I was talking to um, a mother and a grandmother this week uh, that, uh, that I know well, and, and uh, we were talking about some things in regard to the pressure moms feel. And, and uh, you know, they long for the Pinterest-worthy home. You know what that is. You know, you've got to measure up to all these expectations on Pinterest. You take your kids to the zoo, do crafts, throw elaborately themed parties with ponies and princesses, and you have a successful career, and you keep up a hobby, and you post on Facebook, and you work out five times a week, and you pray every day for an hour and you're a homeroom mother and you're doing laundry and you're reading books and you're giving baths and telling stories and singing songs and you feed your kids organic kale and carrots that you grew in your own garden. Think about that. And uh, you'd rather be eating Oreos and ice cream, but you've made the sacrifice. I wonder, do any moms in this social media society ever feel that kind of pressure? I mean, it's true. And if you're a working mom, you know, you might feel guilty because you're not at home with the kids. But when you're at home with the kids, you feel guilty because you're not contributing financially. And I mean, you have this degree and you have the ability and jobs are available and you could try to juggle both. But then you feel like you probably wouldn't do a good job at either. And there's this tension on both sides of the equation. But the reality is, this is not just a mom problem. It's an everybody problem. And the dealing with the pursuit of perfection is something probably many of us have faced. We live in this world that is constantly trying to measure up to the expectations of others. And uh, we're putting unrealistic expectation on ourselves and others. We're trying to live up to what we believe God wants us to do. And then it just seems like we continually keep falling short. So many of us battle it. Let's talk about it just briefly as we set up where we're headed. The three types of perfectionists. The first is the self-oriented uh, perfectionist. This is a person who places unrealistic expectations on themselves. They battle feelings of guilt quite often because it sometimes can even lead to the point of inefficiency in their own lives. If that's you, you might be prone to procrastinate, struggling with deep feelings of inadequacy yourself because you just don't feel like you measure up. The second is the externally oriented perfectionist. That's the person who tries to live up to the perceived, and I would put in quotes, perceived expectation of others, what they think others think of them. And if that's you, you believe others expect you to be perfect. The externally oriented perfectionist tends to use uh, self-deprecating humor as a defense. You might make fun of your work ethic or your appearance as maybe just kind of a way to try to cope. 
may feel lonely or depressed because you'll never measure up to what is your idea of what others expect of you. And then the third is the others-oriented perfectionist, and that's when you impose your expectations on somebody else. The others-oriented perfectionist expects others, you expect other people to live up to your impossible standards. And uh, that's a person who's going to lack empathy. They often tear others down, use abrasive or demeaning language toward those who don't meet their expectations or standards. I have a feeling that there could be some of you who would say, you know what, I, I grew up with a parent like that. And then if we were really honest, there'd be some of us who'd have to raise our hand and say, and I am a parent like that. That could be where you live. Today, uh, we're going to focus on perfectionism, but we're going to focus on the spiritual side of perfectionism. So often we think of perfectionism as a psychological issue, and it is, but at its root, at its root, perfectionism can be an indicator of a spiritual problem. It can be an indicator of a spiritual problem. Perfectionism is often how we attempt to hide our, our deepest insecurities, our doubts, our fears, it can be a way that we attempt to cope with our, uh, or mask our insecurity or our own sinfulness. Perfectionism, you see, is creating this illusion that if I live up to a certain standard, then I'll be good enough to please myself. Not only will I be good enough to please myself, but I'll be good enough to please others. And ultimately, I'll be good enough to please God. And that's our goal. So we're going to go all the way back to the Garden of Eden this morning. Adam and Eve, they were perfect and holy before God. And they lived in this pressure free environment and uh, then they sinned they disobeyed God's clear command God said don't do it they did it and they suffered the pressure and we're still suffering the pressure today uh, from that the pressure was on when they went down that path and so they immediately felt because of their sin they felt insecurity they felt doubt they felt fear they felt afraid so what did they do they went into hiding they hid from God they created coverings for themselves. You remember reading how they were ashamed. They didn't want God to see their imperfection. And, and so for the first time in history, humanity was dealing with insecurities, imperfection, and sinfulness. So it's at its root, perfectionism is a spiritual problem. And we need God's help to resolve it. The book of Romans shows us how we are made right with God. You know this. In fact, Paul was uh, speaking directly to the craving for perfectionism in Romans chapter 3, verse 20. He says, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, none of us are made right with God by doing what the law commands. I want you to get that. That's because none of us completely obey the law. None of us completely obey the law of God. In other words, on our own, we can never fully achieve the standards. We can never get 100%. We never get perfection there. So what's the purpose of the law? Well, we know from Scripture, the law reveals how sinful we are. The law reveals that we need help. We're never going to be good enough on our own. We need grace and we need mercy. Now, in Jesus' day, the Pharisees, uh, they didn't live up to just 10 commandments. They were focused on 613. Can you imagine that? I mean, that's crazy. We only have 10. But I'm going to tell you right now, and this is the truth, I don't know anybody that is 100% effective of li at living up to the 10. Now, you may think, are you kidding? You know, people breaking the Ten Commandments, you, you're talking about ten, only ten, and you don't know anybody that does that perfectly all the time? I, I don't. So I'm going to do a little self-evaluation here, and I want you to think about uh, how, how are you doing with the Ten Commandments? For instance, do you ever put anything ahead of God? I mean, could you don't raise your hand, but do, do you ever put anything ahead of God? Have you ever allowed anything or anyone to crowd God out of the place that he should rightfully hold in your life? I mean, we're just focused on the Ten Commandments and don't have any other gods before me. Are you doing well with that? Or how about the one about not lying? Don't, you know, don't lie. I'm always amazed when I hear professing Christians, I've heard this so many times down through the years, they'll say to me, well, Steve, I, I just, I had to lie. What? You had to break the Ten Commandments? 
You know, you, you had to lie to your boss about why you were late. You had to lie to your wife. You had to lie to your husband. You had to lie to your kids. I mean, what, what's that all about? Or, you know, the one about don't commit adultery. And some of you are like, oh, good. I can say I did. I haven't committed adultery. At least there's that. Well, but Jesus, you remember how he took it up a notch? He said, hey, if you look at a woman even lustfully, you've already committed adultery in your heart. See, no matter how hard you try, you can't get there 100% of the time, even with the 10. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the problem today is that people just don't want to face that. They don't want to face the truth. You know, don't call me a sinful person. I'm not a sinner. I'm not a bad person. I'm a good person. Don't judge me. And I'm going to tell you, this is not about judging it at all. It's just about telling the truth. You know, human beings are broken. We're messed up. We're all not, you know, that good. We're sinners in need of a Savior. Romans chapter 3, verse 10 says, as it's written, there's no one righteous, not even one. So I just want to say to the, those of you here, and welcome to those online, welcome to the point where we make you feel good about yourself on a Sunday morning just like this, you know. We're not here to make you feel better about yourself. We're here to proclaim God's truth, even when it's difficult to hear. We're going to tell the truth. Um, <clears throat> now, have, have you ever thought to yourself, well, I'm not too bad. I'm a pretty good person. I mean, we can keep going. I mean, have you ever lied? Have you ever hurt somebody's feelings by your words or the tone of your voice? Are you bitter toward anybody? Do you get angry with the people that disagree with you? See, my point is, I want you to understand we are all guilty before God. We are all guilty before God, and we have to remember who we are in his sight. So there's no need to deny that we're a sinner in need of a Savior. Instead, what we need to do is allow our desperate need to draw us close to Jesus, not run from him. Scripture says that our heart is deceitful above all things, and our hearts are so messed up that we can't even tell the truth about ourselves, folks. None of us uh, have the capacity in our own sinfulness to live up to God's holy standard. It's not that I want to make you feel bad about yourself, but here's the thing. Until you see yourself as a sinner, you will never see your need as a savior, for a savior. Until you see yourself as a sinner, you will never see your need for a savior. That's why the law is a good thing. It shows us we need help. It shows us that if I can't be perfect, if I can't live up to God's standard on my own, I can look to him. You know, what else can I do? I mean, how can I be made right with God otherwise? Paul goes on to tell us that we're not made right with God by religious efforts, by doing good works, by eliminating the bad stuff from our lives, or even by joining the church. You know how we're made right with God? One way. We're made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus. That's how we're made right with God. Jesus Christ is the sinless son of God who is perfect in every way. And he's the one who hung out with sinners and loved the unrighteous and gave his life as a sacrifice for our sins. We're made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And that's true for everybody who believes. Um, it doesn't matter how bad you are. It doesn't matter how much you've messed up. It doesn't matter how much darkness there is in your life. What I'm telling you is the truth of God, according to God's word. And it applies to all of us. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've been. You're made right with God through faith in Jesus Christ and him alone. It's not church attendance. You know, Jesus plus church attendance, that's what's going to get me to heaven. That's how I'm made right with God. Nope. It's not Jesus plus my good works. I'm going to go do some good deeds and I'm going to serve down at the food pantry and I'm going to help somebody out and I'm going to walk some elderly lady across the street. And it's not that. It's not Jesus plus I'm going to stop doing some bad things. I'm going to do less bad things. It's not Jesus plus anything. Here's the equation in your notes. Jesus plus nothing is how I made right with God. I hope you remember that. We talk about that often around here. Jesus plus nothing is how I made right with God. Jesus, the perfect son of God, and faith in him alone, that's what redeems us. It's not about being perfect. It's about the grace of God. That's what it's about. Perfectionism, see, that's what focuses on what I do. It focuses on me, my performance, my effort, my religious works. But grace, on the other hand, focuses on what Jesus has already done. 
It's his righteousness. It's his goodness. It's his perfect work. Perfectionism, all about me. Grace, all about Jesus. Perfectionism believes if I obey, if I'm good enough, if I'm holy enough, then maybe, then maybe God will love me. But grace, it's so much different because it starts with the love of God. Because God loves me, because he accepts me through Christ, I can obey. obey. See, my obedience is a response to his goodness. Perfectionism says I need God's approval. You know, I, I, I need to win it. I need to get it somehow. I've got to do something to get God's approval. But grace says because of Jesus, I'm already living in the approval of God. It's not works so that I can boast. It is grace by faith in Christ because of who Jesus is, because of what he's done. When I put my faith in him, I can relax in him because of who Jesus is. Because of Jesus, the pressure is off. And, and so today, that's what I want to do. I want to encourage you to embrace grace today, to step into the goodness of God. You, you don't have to be perfect to please him. And for some of you, that's a big statement. And you may not even believe it right now, but I hope you'll live with it this week. I hope you'll think about it. I hope you'll let it sink in and settle in to your heart and to your mind. You don't have to be perfect to please him. You don't have to get it right every time to live up to his standards because of what Jesus did. See, you do your best and you trust God to make up the difference. I'm shooting for 100% and I got 88 but Jesus made up the 12. I'm shooting for perfect and I, I got 75, but Jesus made up the 25. We still got 100 because that's what takes the pressure off. If we truly understand this, it shouldn't just change the way we think. It should also change everything about how we relate with people. It'll change how we live. You know, my prayer is that you'll experience a deeper understanding of the grace of God in your life. And I pray that it'll impact your life on a level that will truly, truly change the way you live. Because when the pressure's off, suddenly we can choose people over perfection. And some of you have been doing just the opposite. You've been choosing perfection over people. But when the pressure's off, we can choose people over perfection. We get to choose intimacy. We get to choose relationship. We get to choose depth of connection instead of performance or perfectionism. I mean, don't miss the moment trying to live up to some unattainable standard. When the pressure's off, we can choose perfect love over perfect performance. We can choose the perfect love of our Father rather than performing to try to impress Him or anybody else for that matter. And here's why that matters. Perfectionism is really about covering up our deepest fears. It's about covering for our insecurity. And it's an unhealthy way to cover up our sinfulness. So I wonder, what is your greatest insecurity? What are you trying to cover up? Could be deep feelings of inadequacy. For some, it's shame. Uh, Whatever it is, it's a cover-up, and you don't have to be perfect. I know some of you are saying, hey, but wait a minute. Didn't, Didn't you just say a minute ago, didn't Jesus say to be perfect? Isn't there a verse about that someplace? Yeah, there is. It's in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, the Sermon on the Mount. I referenced it earlier. You are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Be perfect. Well, no pressure there, you know. I mean, perfect, just like God. Are you kidding me? Does that mean I never sin, never have a bad thought go through my mind? I never say the wrong thing. I never do the wrong thing. Be perfect. Be perfect, just as your heavenly Father It's perfect. Seems to undermine your entire message, Steve. You you might as well give it up now. You know, it does seem to undermine the message until you put this verse in its proper context. See, the context of Jesus' teaching is in this portion of Scripture. It's, It's not about performance. It's about love. It's not about our behavior. It's about our response to God's love in loving others. If you back up to Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, these verses preceding what we read a moment ago, Jesus said, you've heard that the law says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. It's all about love. Verse 46, if you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. 
It's all about love. And that's why Jesus says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. When he says that, he's not actually talking about our behavior or our performance. He's talking about being perfected in love. I mean, Jesus says, when you've been taught to love those who are nice and hate your enemies, I tell you, love everybody, love freely, love as you've been loved. Reflect the love of God in the way you love others. Be perfect in how you love. Be mature and complete in your love. It's not that you have to be perfect in performance, but it's about growing into the perfect love of God. And yet we work so hard at performance because our deepest fear is that we're going to be inadequate. I'll never be enough. I'll never be successful at home, at work, in, in life. I'll never be a good enough pastor. I'll never measure up. And so we press, get it done, push for more, be perfect, win the approval, stand out, be successful, prove your worth. See, our goal is not to convince people how good we are. Our calling is to convince people how good God is. What a difference when we get it right. Not trying to convince everybody of how good I am. Not trying to convince everybody about how good you are. It is about convincing them how good our God is. It's, it's not about our performance. It's all about Jesus. It's not about our righteousness. It's all about him. I desperately want you to understand, uh, you know, how much God loves you. Have you ever watched a, a nine or 10 or 11 month old kid as they're learning to walk? It's kind of like they're doing the drunk Frankenstein walk down the hall and then boom, they do a face plant right in the carpet, hopefully not on the hardwood floor. How do you respond to that? I mean, what do you do when that happens? Do you look at the little child laying there face down on the floor and say, you pathetic little loser. You don't want to walk. You, you, you did, that was pitiful. I've never seen such a poor attempt at walking in my life. Get up and try that again. That's ridiculous. We wouldn't do that, would we? What do you do? You get down on your knee. You pick them up. You brush them off. You kiss the boo-boo, you give them a hug, and you try it again. That's, that's what you do. You cheer them on. I want you to understand something today, and if you get, get one thing from the message, I hope you get this loud and clear. Our Heavenly Father does not, does not, does not withdraw His love when we fail. I have a feeling that Maybe somebody watching online or somebody right here in the room, you're, you've failed and you haven't felt like you measured up and it's held you down spiritually your entire life. But maybe today that truth could penetrate your heart on a level like it never has before. That your heavenly father, he's standing there watching you learn to walk and you face planted right in front of him. And you have felt like a failure because you've been told that in some other areas of your life and you've kind of projected that over on God. But I want you to understand that's not the way he looks at us. He does not withdraw his love when we fail. He's cheering us on when we get it right. He continues loving us when we get it wrong. That's because his love is unconditional. And there is nothing that you can do to make him love you more. And there's not anything you've done that's made him love you less because he loves you unconditionally. And that's because love is not something God does. Love is who he is. Doesn't that kind of help take the pressure off? I mean, we don't have to perform to gain his approval because we're already approved because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Romans chapter five, verse eight, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's how much he loves us. That's why we can choose people over perfection. That's why we can choose perfect love over perfect performance. You can be complete and confident in the unconditional, undeserved, unreserved love that your heavenly father has for you. That means the pressure for perfection is off. 
you can stop chasing that ever elusive carrot. Let's pray together. Lord, uh, I don't know how this lands with every person here or every person watching online, but I know that your spirit has a way of taking a message like this and applying it to every one of our lives individually. I would just pray today that you would teach us to choose people over perfection. I would pray that you would teach us to choose perfect love over perfect performance. We need, uh, we need wisdom to know how to work through this because this is an issue for some that they've wrestled with their entire lives. Today, I really pray it could be a turning point, a transforming moment when life could be different because you gave us the wisdom to know what to do with what we heard today and then the courage to just step up and do it. We thank you for the amazing, unending, merciful love of our great God who chooses to love us unconditionally and we are so thankful so thankful for your love today in Jesus name
pouring out a life gracefully broken. Just like the last two weeks, this was a challenging one too. Can we stand with our arms wide open and let God truly be the only perfect one? Can we rest in that? We can, only with his help. And as we do that, our lives and the lives of those around us will be changed. Friends, if you are inspired and encouraged this week, would you consider supporting the ministry that happens here inside these walls and outside around our neighborhood and the globe by giving? Here are the ways you can do that. On our website at gotothepoint.com, text the point give on your mobile device to 77977 or mail a check to 311 Meyer Street here in Seymour. And if you're in the room, you can place your offering in one of the boxes on the back wall of the worship center as you exit. Thank you for partnering in ministry with us. And thank you again for joining us this morning. Three carrots down, two to go. Let's get to it. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you right here next week.